Welcome to a Fresh Perspective podcast, catering to the latest in ingredient trends, consumer insights, and food news. Brought to you by Corbion. Welcome to A Fresh Perspective, the podcast that's all about food. I'm CJ McClellan, and I'm joined by my co-host. Jenny, how are you all today? I am doing fantastic. Fantastic. And we have a, a guest that we've had before. I'm so excited to talk to Kathy again. She has, so, she has such good information. And I have yeah. a billion questions for her the whole time. So I try today, not to take over, but I really want to know. Exactly. Today we're talking about like the clean label trend in food and that encompasses like free from real, no preservatives, additives, just kind of any of those claims that we're seeing on food that fall under that umbrella of what could be clean label. Um, and it's definitely one of the most buzzworthy terms and trends today in the food world. And so today we're going to talk about just kind of what that means because the definition varies per person per yeah i don't uh, even know what it means really like, I, I mean it, i, I want to know but I don't everybody know. interprets interprets it super differently and it's always up for debate so today we're gonna kind of have a discussion about just that and how kathy is seeing it play out in the food world but i was just reading an article about the 2020 food trends and food predictions um oh and i feel kind of very trendy because i loved this you are for it apparently was having its renaissance, which is now, and that is <laughs> the Brussels sprout. The Brussels sprout is rising in popularity and getting ready to have its renaissance. And I love Brussels sprouts. And I always have. I do too. I think they got a bad rap. Like, remember when we were kids? Well, I'm older than you, but when <laughs> I was a kid, it was like, in, even if you were reading comic strips, there was like always some kid going, ew, Brussels sprouts, even though like I had never even had always. one. No, and everyone always says that. Like, ew, you like Brussels like sprouts. I loved them as a child. And I don't know if it was because of, it comes back to my condiments. You could smother it in cheese. And as a child, I've loved that and I still to this day we will roast Brussels sprouts in the oven and I will just eat that mm. as like my meal I will just take that and the crispy parts of the Brussels sprout and shovel them into my gullet I love that I put it like a little bit of sea salt and then some cracked um, pepper on top and like sometimes just a little bit of red pepper just for like Ooh, a little bit of a kick nice. um, and, and they really they truly are delicious although I have to say they smell terrible they like, do smell awful, as does broccoli and like cauliflower, because we roast yes, all of that. Like but this is referring them. To, this is a term I've not even heard until now. But they're referring what? to them now as designer vegetables. So it's what so desirable that Brussels sprouts have become a designer vegetable. What does that mean? Are they making them in different colors? I I don't know, but I feel different very, sizes. Very cool now about my love of Brussels sprouts. Which You're going to invite people over and be like, um, I'm making <laughs> Brussels sprout party. vegetables. Brussels sprout party. I mean, the good thing is I think that this falls directly into our trend because I'm sure Brussels sprouts are clean label. At least oh. I'm like 99% sure. Um, but today we are joined by Kathy Sargent again, who is our director of yes. market strategy at Corbion. <laughs> Let's so see if she likes her. Brussels sprouts. I can't wait. Do your Hi, kids eat them? You know, it's so interesting because I was making them, taking the smothered approach. Like, I'm going to put cream, cheese, and make them super indulgent. My kids said, none of that, just honey. And they love them. Oh. I mean, I've never yeah. tried it with honey, actually. Just with honey. Does it crisp them up or do they, do you roast them? on after. So okay. they like things more steamed because it's softer. Yeah. And then just smothered and Drizzle. Honey. My family does it with like orange juice, bacon, and something else. And they like roast it in there and they come out kind of like citrusy and delicious. I'll have wow. to let my sister know she was so trendy. As kids, I did not like them. But because they looked like little cabbages and she loved Cabbage Patch Kids, she was a huge brush. Oh, see? Kid. She yeah. was on it beforehand. So you can tell her that she is also trendy and a lover of designer vegetables. Yeah, I used to give, like, on my tea parties with my little dolls, it would be Brussels sprouts because they were doll-sized. Oh, that is like a doll-sized thing you put not in that any, Not that any adult, like, puts a, just a cat head of cabbage on their plate and serves it to themselves. But in my childlike brain, it was like, it here is a head of cabbage for my doll. <laughs> well, <laughs> Kathy, we have you here today to talk about one of the most 
buzzworthy items flying around the food world today, and that is clean label. And a small topic. <laughs> very small topic <laughs> and super clear. Um, Not anything to talk about. But just to kick it off, how would you define like this giant trend of clean label, free from real when it comes to baked goods? Ah, yes. Um, it is an ever-changing landscape. I will say that. Um, it's driven a lot by how consumers look at it and transition and manufacturers. But you know, I kind of look at it as a progression too. So free from claims are usually manufacturers trying to call out something unique. So they may isolate one or two ingredients that are free from. You could be free from artificial sweeteners, or free from gluten. artificial flavors, gluten, yes. Yep. So you can isolate and call an individual thing out. When you look at clean label, what I've seen is that is really around uh, manufacturers trying to create a brand. You know, I think the first one that so many of us knew about was Whole Foods. So they had mm -hmm. an entire list. Consumers don't understand that list, but they trust that that brand of Whole Foods is clean label and they kind of take that holistic approach to trusting that brand. And now multiple manufacturers have created their own. Um, certain brands have an identity that they can't be under that brand without falling into those guidelines. So that's kind of a progression to more than just a one or two things that are called out. And then when you start talking about real or simple, they kind of can group together, it's more recognizable. So it might be shorter ingredient lists. It might be ingredients that you have in your pantry. So when I look at it, it doesn't sound too chemical. It sounds mm -hmm. like something I understand. Um, and it feels like it's going back to nature and something that you know hasn't been heavily processed as much. And I know that we've definitely, or I've seen personally, uh, a big rise in those, the, the real claim, like made with real cherry preservatives or made with you know, real sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup or any of that. To me, it's actually not something that I pay attention to a lot when I shop. I mean, I think that there are definitely brands that I associate maybe that cleaner or realer feel with like Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And I just assume that when I'm shopping there that buying something that's maybe clean label or that I associate with clean label. But overarchingly, when I'm shopping at just the grocery store, I don't specifically hunt down those items. I don't know when you guys are shopping, is that like a big criteria for your purchases? When I used to go shop, when my, when I had little, my child was teeny, you know, like nine months old, I was seeking out organic, clean label, everything when she was starting to eat real foods. Cause I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to pollute her body with, yep. you know, chemicals. Now I buy ramen noodles and frozen pizzas. I mean, <laughs> it has changed. My life has changed because they won't eat those things and they don't care. Um, and, and I mean, I guess I care a little, I do, I want to be as healthy as I can be, but in my brain, clean label is associated with higher cost. And mm. like you guys and know, I, I really have point. six people in my family and I need to buy four or five loaves of bread for a week because they just continually eat sandwiches or toast or whatever. And so I'm not buying clean label bread cause that's $3 a, a loaf. I can buy you know, just regular old white bread for 82 cents at the Aldi. So I, I mean, it's funny how it's really, it's truly done like a 180 from when I started and I shopping for children to now. I think that is a really good point and a discussion that I know I've heard s several times is there's definitely the, the balance of value versus mm -hmm. premium and, and how families can purchase and when they purchase which and how clean label impacts both of those and there's yeah. a place for both of them. And I think it is very diverse, you know, and you know, what triggers a consumer to make a purchase can vary. You know, sometimes it's value. It's sometimes it's availability. Um, safe. like now I was going to say right now in, in this <laughs> pandemic, it's just, what can I get in, What's on in the my shelf? Cart. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just filling those bellies. And, you know, sometimes there's, these claims people will actually associate with health and wellness. Um, other times it's just about permissible indulgence. You know, we see in sweet goods, it's a lot about indulgence. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't mess too much with my food, but if it's made with real fruit, that sounds like a good thing. You've and given you me a reason to, to say I can eat this now. <laughs> you know, right. Give that to my kids and you don't sacrifice on the indulgence. 
So that's yep. really key is how do you balance um, adjusting these labels, fitting the consumer's needs, but they're not going to keep eating it if it's too expensive or it doesn't taste good because we have so many choices today that if it's not good, it's not worth the calories in my diet. Exactly. For sure. I better love it if I'm going to eat it and count it and put it in my phone app. And at the end of last year, I know we did a lot of consumer interviews on a, a similar topic, but we asked a question that was specific to this and that was literally almost 100% of them responded with, yeah, no, I would totally try something that said it had less sugar or that you know it was free of this. But if it affected basically anything about the baked good. <laughs> the product. They, they were like, no, then, then, then I'm going to go back to my old one. I don't, I don't want to try it anymore. So, yeah. Try it while I'm on this two-week diet. Yeah. Then I After that, I'm going back. If you've changed anything about my eating experience with this baked good, I'm going back to the one I like. Right. There was a package at Costco that I that we let. So we're, we're shop, we shop at like four different places because, again, we're feeding six people. We got to get all the right stuff from the right places and the right prices. Costco had this tray of desserts. And I don't know if you guys have seen it, but they actually come in little ceramic cups. They were about this big. And there's a dozen of them and they tasted delicious. And it was like four bites. And I was like, this is literally the perfect dessert. Like if everything was sold like this, I am in because I can have four bites. It's like 90 calories. It's delicious. I can hide them from my children if I don't want them to eat them. And I can eat 17 of them in a row and have no guilt. (laughs) See, I just have the one and then I feel satisfied and it lasts me two weeks in my fridge so it's like the perfect thing of all the worlds, right? Like, and it's made by some chef. So I don't know, it wouldn't be considered a pretty clean label, but I don't think there was a lot of preservatives in it. And I mean, it felt like really indulgent. So when you were talking about indulgence and desserts and, and baked goods and those kinds of things, like, I was like, that's like the most, in, it's the perfect indulgence because it's just yep. a few bites. And I think that's, not a whole I mean, a really good call out when it comes to, and I think you were mentioning it, when it comes to baked goods or dessert baked goods, indulgent baked goods, it comes more to giving me that permission to eat it. So it's not necessarily that you've cleaned. I'm looking for any reason that just says, oh, I, now I'm allowed. I, I can eat that and feel good about it because it's <laughs> this is under something is calories. strange about it. Yeah. Just as we look at it over the years, as information has become more available, people get the internet now, you know, there's spikes in the food babe saying something versus food manufacturer saying one thing. How has kind of this clean label definition changed and the demand for it changed over the years? Well, it has changed a lot and I think it'll continue to change. Um, And you're right. It's partly about awareness, you know, new studies come out, new just um, perceptions come out. And it's also, you know, yesterday's target is old news. Um, High fructose corn syrup is mostly gone. So that can't be what we're going after today. So that's yeah. going to be a natural cycle in change because, you know, all of us in this industry and all the manufacturers are trying to differentiate mm-hmm. and they're using this space. And because it's so undefined to differentiate, you know, and it goes back to what claims am I going to make? What's different about my product versus my direct competitor? And so these front of pack type conversations is a big way that they're doing that. I am super enjoying this conversation because I find it extremely interesting, but we're going to take a few minutes to hop into, yes, what time is it? To eat, save, (laughs) give our segment of the episode. Now it's time for eat, save, give a thoughtful peek into the heart, minds, and taste palates of our guests. Music always gets me like super amped up. I feel like I should be doing the Charleston. Be like a high porn, like pew, 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 pew. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, so the music. So eat, save, give. It's our segment eat, where save, we give, give you. Except three, for today, today it's going to be drink. Three drinks, mm-hmm. and you're going to have to decide which one are you going to drink have right now. Mm-hmm. Have right now. Which one are you going to save for later? Which one are you going to give away to me or kick it out the someone door. else? So, okay. The, the drinks are non-alcoholic, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do an alcoholic one eventually, but these are non-alcoholic drinks that we're either going to drink now, save it for later, or give away. Um, so the first is a fancy coffee drink, and like think a la Starbucks, right? Like half cap, no whip, with skim, you know, all the things. Like my order takes like 10 minutes at Starbucks. It. Yeah. Okay. And I know they don't like me, and I try to smile and be real nice, like... Sorry, Sorry, guys. 
That's why they're Starbucks. That's true. Good, and I love it. And I always tip them. So, you know, they like me. I'm um, okay. So that's one. The second thing is like a smoothie. So like smoothie king or a smoothie that you make in your own house, even with all the ingredients you like, but like frozen fruit and all the other good things with a straw. Um, drinking a smoothie makes me feel very bougie, but I don't actually <laughs> like it. <laughs> it's like oh this is my grapefruit smoothie and secretly inside i'm like why am i having this so funny. but that's what i anyway okay and then the last <laughs> we know what you're gonna give away yeah i know i, I know. know sorry i'm giving mine away right now um and then the last one is like um like english tea so like loose leaf with cream and like a sugar cube and mm. all the things so okay i'll stop talking Kathy, what about you? All right. Well, the gift was kind of easy because I'm not too big of a tea person. Just okay. Me. Um, so that I think I'll pass on, even though I know it's good for me and I should drink a lot more tea. I go towards the coffee. Now the other two, I'm a little torn. Um, I think I'm going to save my coffee for when I have my afternoon slump because I'm feeling a little jittery. Just the mm. time of the day. <laughs> 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 I've had a lot of coffee already, so I'm going to go into my, my fruit smoothie and get my vitamins and my energy. Love it. I'm going to second that. That is literally the exact I would do. I would drink my smoothie now. I I do feel bougie when I drink smoothies and they're like $17 when you buy them places. I know. Um, And really not that much cheaper when I make them at home. Um, But I love them and I do feel healthy and I'd start my day and I'm just like, yes, I'm awesome i'm a god <laughs> that drinks healthy things in the morning i make them and, for my kids and kind of call them ice cream <laughs> and i'm like look how healthy you are look at this homemade ice cream we made and it's like purple yep for some reason if i if I, if I drink sure. a smoothie and like do any amount of working out in the morning i just f- feel like i've achieved life for that day and so I, I, yeah i'm gonna drink my smoothie and i will save my coffee for the same reason because every day at like two o'clock i'm like I need my afternoon coffee and I'm going to yes. give away the tea, even though I do enjoy tea in the winter. It's like the only thing I drink hot, but I don't ever pick it over other things if I have a choice. And normally I just pick it because I'm jittery because I've over caffeinated myself. <laughs> Cause I've seen you drink loose leaf tea at work. Yes, like I've I seen you yeah. make it with the little bags. Yeah. Um, so fun fact about me, it's kind of like Marge. We had Marge as a guest and she does not like eggs at all. Oh, um, no. I do not like fruit. Like I'll what? drink a few fruit flavored things, but like Who doesn't I doesn't like fruit. Gag. I don't like any of it. I don't like berries. I don't like, Bananas, I don't like apples. Oranges? Oh God, don't eat banana. Yeah, lemon or fruit. Because we know you like lemon. Lemon, that is true, but I like it flavored. Like I would I don't I would never first of all, I would never eat a lemon. But like I mean like a this lemon is- cake. I mean take take a fruit and make it into a cake. I'm probably gonna eat it clearly. So but strange. um but like, just like some people that get an apple and just bite it, it hurts my teeth mouth. I mean, why? I don't understand I, it. <laughs> so smoothie is what I'm giving away, now, even though I feel bougie, but it's, it, it's all a lie. It's all in my mm. head. Um, I'm going to drink my fancy coffee drink right now because I will drink fancy, fancy coffee drinks every day. And I want every it to your life. I want, I always get no, I always get like skim milk with whip and I feel like it balances and calories and doesn't but i feel like that um and then i am also going to give away my tea even though i do also like tea and it's kind of like my toppy nose like afternoon i'm gonna have tea oh fancy. <laughs> well we are going to hop back in we are joined by kathy Sargent, who is the director of market strategy at corbion and we are talking about that clean label Free from real trend that is carrying through the food the industry. Nation. Yeah. <laughs> Weeping um, the nation. And before the segment, we were talking about uh, the changes, how that's changed over the years. Um, and so we can just hop back in there. And one question that popped into my head while we were talking about it was some of the fad diets that we see. So now there's paleo, there's keto, there's Weight Watchers, there's all kinds, gluten-free, et cetera, of fad diets. Do you think that that is... Uh, playing in to some of this clean label, real free from trends that we're seeing or the growth of those items? It can. Um, I think some of those are, are driven by, I mean, you look at Whole30 and the level of processing and the freshness of those ingredients is part of the diet. Yeah. Uh, others, it's really about the nutrient density. 
you know, mm -hmm. keto doesn't, you know, some people will say it's better to have organic or minimally processed, but it's really about the nutrient content. So it, it varies. I think Weight Watchers um, is less about the clean label aspect, but they lean into certain types of foods, you know, fruits, vegetables, lean meats, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So they can influence, but in, in different ways and some more than others. Hmm. I mean, yeah, and I my tried. Weight Watchers apps actually, like when I look at it, it'll tell me what brand to buy in wow. order to meet my point thing. Oh. You know, like if I want to make this, I'll put in the recipe and it'll be like, make sure you buy Appleton Farm sausage or whatever, because it's a specific number of points. So I've, I think they're shaping a little bit there, like you were saying. Yeah. I've tried basically every fad diet that exists in the history <laughs> totally. of the nation. I we just love a new diet. And Whole30 was definitely the one that affected my purchasing the most just because there's so many things you can't have. I had to buy like $7 mustard that had no sugar <laughs> and no anything in it. It was crazy, but I can't some of it I kept. Because I'm a dairy girl and I can't I, give it the cheese. I was me too. So, I was like, I love it too. I know. So do you think that demand for clean label products and real free from has peaked or do you think that we'll continue to see it increase as I time? A new phase. You know, mm -hmm. I think it'll continue to be present. I think, the idea of transparency is huge and mm -hmm. that goes back to labeling. And so it usually goes back to clean. Nobody says add a bunch of chemicals to my foods. Um, but I think it'll morph, you know, now we're talking a lot about where our foods come from. And right mm -hmm. now, you know, in the middle of a pandemic more than ever, it's, we want to understand what kind of contact, where it originated, that type of transparency. So mm -hmm. that, isn't really clean, but that uh, could be something new that emerges in a bigger way. Um, going back to nature, it, we at Corbion do a lot with this. It's we find really valuable technology that's already present. Um, people, animals, plants have an amazing ability to nourish themselves, to protect themselves, and that's where we find a lot of our technology. And then we can bring that to scale and use it as functional ingredients. So I think as consumers want to understand the connection to nature, understand the transparency of their ingredients, this approach is going to be big. You know, I was thinking about when you were just saying um, the transparency. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how old everyone on this call is right now, but when I was in high school, there was this whole like fat-free trend, right? And and I'm sure you remember like it was like diet food came in prepackaged boxes now, right? Like you could buy like diet um, granola bars and diet all these things, all these low fat, low whatever things. Um, and it turned and I felt one once all of it came out that like it was full of fillers mm -hmm. and and all kinds of um, you know things that are bad for you. Mm -hmm. I felt lied to and cheated by those brands <laughs> like <laughs> the smart ones you. brands like okay so basically maybe i lost a few pounds but i've just filled my body with chemicals and so i personally have a hard time trusting what's on my labels like i'm mm -hmm. like yeah yeah is it really diet i mean is it really going to be better for me to eat this because that's what they said back 20 years ago and it kind of ruined my trust and so i think transparency is a really interesting topic because I want transparency, but I have to like get to a point where I can believe it when I read. I, we didn't have like huge. Yeah. diet bars coming out, but I do remember my mom buying like diet shakes and diet bars. But when I was in school, they, it was when they transitioned from like, we used to have the soda machines and they took all of those out and replaced it with like fructopia. Do you remember like the fruit juice? Which, <laughs> which is was, straight sugar. Yeah. It was literally yeah. like the exact same thing. It just had like <laughs> a fruit label on it. But I, that's what I remember is when they transitioned to that and made us all feel like we were healthier because we were drinking fruit juice. Yeah, see, it's like a lie. Right. I want to know the real truth. Like if <laughs> the if there was truth. like a section of my grocery store that was like, this is the real truth, like that. But and then you buy there. like you just said, Kathy, that high fructose corn syrup is mostly gone now, but like it was in everything we ate for decades. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know or uh, no, I didn't even know that I needed to care about it. Like I rely on the news to tell me those things. I'm no scientist or, you know, or you guys. <laughs> and we want to be able to trust the food that we have. You know, and we find that most consumers don't want to have to research everything they buy. Oh, they don't even exhausting. want to have to look at the labels unless there's a reason to displace their trust. 
Right. So as an industry, we do have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. Well, we have time for one more question. And really what has been cultivating in my mind this whole time is we've talked about clean label and the, some of the different definitions and how people are perceiving it. And then, so there's this almost, there's a demand or a desire for clean label from consumers. There's mm -hmm. also a desire for value and mm. a demand to keep your baked good, you know, the texture, the same, the quality, the same. How do manufacturers balance kind of that teeter totter of clean label versus value or this triad and what consumers are saying versus the technologies that are available out there? Like how do Absolutely. we? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we do see a lot with just providing choices, you know, having an indulgent brand that having a value brand, having a clean label brand and figuring out what are the trade-offs? Is it really in quality? Is it in indulgence? Is it in cost? Or can we do it all? Mm -hmm. So as technology continues to advance, as we get better economy of scale with the type of ingredients available, we can start to merge some of that together. And that's where you can see clean label starting to go more mainstream. Um, so it usually tends to start in your premium high priced, um, your more adventurous sense. consumer, those that are very strict with their diets. And then as it works its way into mainstream, even into the value brands, it's because it's advanced in performance. The competitive environment has really influenced it. The scale is now there. Um, and so that's when it can go more mainstream. And, and some ingredients make it and some never get to that point. Uh, some kind of lose momentum and and fade out. Well, this is a very intriguing topic. As I mentioned earlier, I we are con continually talking about this in the food industry and the way it's changing and shifting. And I know that it will continue to change and shift and everyone will continue to have questions. So thank you for joining us and providing a little bit of clarity on a topic that is not extremely clear. Happy to be here. Thank you. And if you are looking for more information on Clean Label, uh, what consumers are saying, what they're asking for, how manufacturers can meet that, you can hop on over to our blog at thebakersteak.com where you will find articles on all of the trends so and much insights yes, on, in the food industry um, and recipes and videos and all of that good stuff, thebakersteak.com. I'm going to go make another coffee. Keep creating.